Well, it is a great joy and privilege to be here today and have been invited by your president, Dr. Cantor, and I have loved him and known him for many years, and he has taken a real risk by having me to come today because you never know what, uh, what may happen. But I'm coming home today because North Georgia is my home. I was born and reared about two and a half, mi uh, two and a half hours east of here and or west of here in Rome, Georgia. Some of you may know where that is. Some of you may be from that area. And uh, so it is great to be able to be back in the great state of Georgia and especially in beautiful North Georgia. And I'm excited to hear what God is doing through you and your president and your faculty and your staff here at Truett McConnell College to know that you are now uh, over 500 and your enrollment and the great things that I hear uh, that God is doing here. We rejoice with you in all that you are doing. I had the privilege of serving uh, alongside of Dr. Cantor at Southwestern Seminary. He and I were colleagues together. He and I were deans together. And uh, we've been looking for a way to get rid of him for a long time. We finally were able to do that. Pawn him off on you here. But uh, he's doing a superb job here. I don't know of anyone that I admire any more than Dr. Canner. And I appreciate so very much him, his sweet wife. And you follow him as he leads you here because he will do and is doing a superb job, and he'll lead you down the right path, and he will help you to focus on that which is truly important during this particular time in your life. And then what can I say about uh, Danny and Miss Bobby Mooseberger? Miss Bobby is the w most wonderful lady around. I just love her to death. Uh, I, don't know much, don't, don't, I don't know much good to say about Danny, her husband, but I do know that she is a wonderful lady. And Danny, it's good to be back with you and Bobby, Miss Bobby today. And uh, David Drake sitting over here. David Drake, I'm so glad to see you as well. Pastor of First Baptist Church of Ella J, not too far uh, down the road. And David and I uh, sort of grew up uh, in the same home church there at West Rome Baptist Church in Rome, Georgia. And he's a whole lot older than I am. And uh, really, uh, I've never really cared for David too much, to be honest. I really don't like him. There are about three reasons for that. David, just stand up for a minute. Just stand up. Stand up. <laughs> I want you to do that. Just stand up and look at it. Okay. Now, just remain standing for a minute. Uh, there, there are three reasons why I do not like David. Number one, he's tall. I hate tall people, don't you? And, and number two, he's thin. Doesn't it just drive you nuts when people are thin? I just, you know, I just hate that. He's thin. And number three, he's handsome. I mean, he, you know, he's just got it all, and I don't have any of it. And it just drives me nuts. But uh, David, I, I appreciate the fact that you came here to make me, to help me feel inferior today, and I certainly do now. <laughs> you know, so thank you for that. No, I appreciate you, David. I know you're preaching the word there, and I thank God for you. Listen, I want you to turn with me to my favorite book in the New Testament, the book of Hebrews. Find your place in the 12th chapter. We're going to focus on the first two verses today. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Here's the question I want to ask you. If you were to choose a sporting event that would describe the Christian life, what would you choose? If you were to choose a sporting event that would describe and illustrate the Christian life, what would you choose? Well, the author of Hebrews, whomever he may have been, chose the long-distance race to illustrate the Christian life. Look at what he says in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, and laying aside, that's a participle there for all of you English majors, laying aside the every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Well, you notice that the author chooses the long-distance race to illustrate the Christian life. Did you notice he doesn't choose the 100-yard dash? He chooses the long-distance race. Speed is important when you are stealing second base. Speed is important 
when you are running the 100-yard dash. But when you are running the marathon, the 26.2-mile marathon, speed is not important. Endurance is important. And speed is not what is critical in the Christian life, spiritually speaking. Endurance is. In fact, did you notice not only does the author use the picture and metaphor of the race, but in each of the three verses that we didn't, we're not going to deal with verse three for the sake of time, but in each of the three verses, one, two, and three, you will find the repetition of the word endurance. You find it in verse one, two, and three. The author is focusing on the fact that we are to endure in the Christian life. You ever feel like quitting? You ever feel like things are too tough? Classes are too difficult? I can't figure this out? Do you ever feel like uh, the problems in life are just make it uh, to such an extent that you cannot, you don't want to go on? Well, the early church had the same problems. People your age then had the same problems. And so the author is writing to encourage them and to challenge them to press on to maturity, to run the race with endurance that is set before them with endurance. Now, I want you to notice that word race. Look at that word in your Bible. Guess what? In the Greek New Testament, it's the word agon. A-G, long O-N. You might transliterate it. Agon. Now, what does that sound like? What word in English does that sound like? Yep, that sounds like the word agony. And that's a good word the Greeks chose, isn't it, for the race? Because they knew that running a long-distance race is agony. I remember when I was in high school, West Rome High School, I ran cross country. I ran long distance race, long distance running, cross country running. I know you you can't imagine that now and it's quite shocking, but believe it or not, actually then uh, I did do that. And uh, up and down and up and down the hills of North Georgia practicing and it was agony to run cross country in North Georgia. You know that that's the case. We, if you've ever run a marathon, is there anybody here who's ever run a marathon? Let me see. Anybody ever run one? Let me see. Anybody? 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 Okay. Don't see any hands up. Well, nor have I. The longest distance I've ever run was 9.2 miles at the uh, turkey trot on Thanksgiving Day in Dallas, Texas. I did that a couple of years in a row. That's the length, the longest time, I've, longest distance I've ever run. Well, a marathon is 26.2 miles. That is a long way. And you have to endure in running the marathon. And it hurts from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet. Every nerve and fiber in your body hurts before you get to the end. It is painful. But you know, a race is also characterized by progress. There is a starting line. There is a finish line. Regardless of how long the race is, there is a place you begin, a place you finish. The Christian life is like that. There is a place you begin the moment you're saved. There is a place that you finish the moment Jesus calls you home to be with him. And in between, you're on the track. You are running the race, and it is a marathon. You don't run it in a day or two. It's a lifetime of living for Jesus, serving him, walking with him, fellowshipping with him, and doing his will for your life. That's what the author is implying here or stating when he says we are to with endurance run this race, look at it, that has been set before us. It is not optional to run. You can't sit up here in the grandstands and watch everybody else run. You don't have that luxury. You have to run. You have to live for Jesus yourself. No one can run your race for you. You can't run someone else's race for them. You must live for Christ. You must serve him. You must stay faithful to him. You must, with endurance, run the race that is set before you. You must make progress. You know, I've learned as I've studied the book of Hebrews through the years that the author of Hebrews is not so much interested in perfection as he is interested in progression. Let me just ask you a question wherever you are spiritually right now. Are you making progress in your Christian life? Are you moving forward? Are you further along spiritually this week than you were three or four or five weeks ago? Are you moving forward? Are you making progress in your Christian life? A race is characterized by progress. But you've got to run in the right direction. If you get off the track, you'll be disqualified. You have to run on the track in the right direction for the goal or you will be disqualified. 
The year was 1928. Southern California played Georgia Tech in the Rose Bowl. On the field that day, an event occurred that made sports history. There was a fumble on the field, and a man by the name of Roy Regals picked up the football. He began to run, dodging a tackler here, eluding a guy over here. He was making a beautiful run. It was a long run, an 80-yard run, the best run of the day. But finally, Roy Regals was tackled by his own teammates just short of his own goal line because in all of the confusion of the fumble, he had become disoriented and he picked up the ball and ran 80 yards in the wrong direction. He earned a nickname as a result of that. You still read about him today. They called him Wrong Way Regals. I wonder if God ever looks down from heaven on Truett McConnell College and says, oh my, there goes a Wrong Way Bill. There's a Wrong Way Susan. There's a Wrong Way Tammy. There's a Wrong Way Tom always running off in the wrong direction spiritually. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Now, I want you to notice, let's do a little exposition this morning. I want you to look at the structure of this text. We believe in text-driven preaching, all right? So we let the structure of the text determine the structure of the sermon. That's what genuine expository preaching is. And when you do that in verses 1 and 2, you'll find, first of all, in your Greek New Testament, this is one sentence. Number two, you will find that there is one main verb and one main independent clause. Number three, you will find that everything else in these entire two verses modifies and explains that main clause. I right, know here's how it works. The main thing the author wants you to walk away with today is this statement. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And everything else modifies that and explains that and tells you how to go about doing it. So I want you to look with me how we do that. First of all, at the very beginning of the verse, the author says, since we have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us run with endurance the race set before us. So the first thing we need to figure out today is who is that cloud of witnesses? You say, oh, I know, I know, pick me, pick me. Okay, what do you say? Oh, well, that's great granddaddy who's died and gone on to heaven. And that's my grandmother who died and was a great Christian lady and she's gone on to heaven. And that's Aunt Sophie who was a great Christian and she died and she's gone on to heaven. And they're all in the grandstands and they're watching me run the race. Well, to quote John Wayne, not hardly. I don't think that's what the author means. Now, when you read the Bible and study the Bible, the key is always context. And so you notice that he says, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, you see the word witness there. And then when you go back to verses 39 and 40 of the previous chapter, and then go back to verse 1 and 2 of chapter 11 as well, you will see, for example, in Hebrews 11 too. After giving us that definition of faith, he says, For by it, men and women of old gained approval. The word there in Greek is, were witnesses. And then you see the same thing at the end of chapter 11. And so now we discover that contextually, the witnesses surrounding us are people who have lived the life of faith, serving God, and who've gone before us. They're dead now. They're God's hall of fame of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. Now, when you read through Hebrews 11, there are some interesting names there. You read about uh, Enoch, and you read about Noah, and you read about Abraham, you read about Sarah, and you read about Moses and a host of others, culminating, by the way, in Rahab. That's interesting, isn't it, ladies? That he no doesn't mention Joshua in Hebrews 11, but he mentions Rahab as the great hero there of Jericho. That's quite interesting. Culminates with Rahab. And so here we have this great cloud of witnesses surrounding us. They bear testimony. They bear witness. What is a witness? If somebody goes to court and they go to the witness box, what is their responsibility? Tell what they know. Tell what they saw. 
Well, that's what these men and women of faith in Hebrews 11, the author is calling on them to tell their story. Their lives become illustrations that a life lived by faith in God is the only life worth living. And the author is saying to his people, and thus the Holy Spirit to us today, the author is saying to us that we have those who've gone before us upon whose shoulders we stand. You're here at a college, Truett McConnell College. I have to confess, I know very little about the history of this school. I do not know uh, about those who founded it. I couldn't tell you about their personal lives, their history, but I can tell you this. Somebody who came before you invested time, invested money, invested energy, and had a vision for this school. And they provided for this school and they didn't know you existed and it was a long time before any of us probably existed and yet they had a vision that down the road people like you would be here at this institution studying as you are. They are the ones who've gone before you. They're a great cloud of witnesses. We always stand on the shoulders of those who've gone before us, don't we? If I had the time and I don't and I won't take the time and David would know these names. I could tell you the cloud of witnesses of shoulders upon whom he and I stand, of men and women who've gone before us who are now in heaven at West Rome Baptist Church over there in Rome, Georgia. And they bore, bore testimony to the fact that the life lived by faith in God, that's the way you succeed in running the race with endurance. Seeing we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Number two. Look at what else he says. And laying aside, it's another participle, and laying aside every encumbrance and the sin that so easily entangles us. Have you ever noticed that you cannot run very well if you have any kind of weights that are impeding your progress? You ever notice that? Notice the author says we are to run this race by casting aside, discarding, Getting rid of anything and everything that would hinder you from running the race. Now, when I was in high school, I told you I ran cross country. Do you know how we would train in those days for cross country? And by the way, I'm told that uh, coaches don't do this anymore. They apparently determined it's not actually the best way to train. But that in those days, uh, I wore ankle weights that were leather ankle weights filled with sand, two and a half pounds on each leg. And after school, about three days a week, we'd have practice. And I would put on those ankle weights, and then those of us on the cross-country team, we'd run up and down the hills there uh, in Rome, Georgia, up and down those hills, training for the next cross-country meet. All right? Now, can you imagine what would happen if on the day of the meet, here we are, and we got all the schools there. We've got West Rome, we've got East Rome, we've got Darlington, We've got uh, all of the other schools that have come in for this particular meet. And I'm there lined up, ready to go. The coach has given his last, his last punch word to us, you know, before the gun goes off and we start. And then the coach looks down and he notices I'm wearing my ankle weights. And he says, David, 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 you forgot to take off your ankle weights. And I say to him, no, I didn't, no, I didn't. I'm planning to run in them today. And he says, What? And I said, oh, yeah, I've grown accustomed to them. I kind of like them. I'm used to them. And so today I'm going to run with my weights. Now, what do you think my coach would say to me? Well, of course, he would know that I was a nut burger, six fries short of a Happy Meal, if I were to take that approach. That's not how you run cross country or short distance or any kind of running. You don't wear weights that hold you back. Now, if it's stupid to do that in running, why do you do that in the Christian life? Why are some of you today trying to run the race of the Christian life and you haven't discarded some of those weights? You're carrying around all that baggage. You've got those spiritual ankle weights, the encumbrances that are keeping you from being everything you ought to be. I'm not going to try to practically apply that for the sake of time today. You determine through the help of the Holy Spirit what's hindering you today. What's hindering you? What are the attitudes that are holding you back? What actions are you involved in? What are you not involved in that you should be involved in that hinders you from running the Christian life? 
So laying aside the weight and look at it, the sin which so easily besets us. I wonder what that is. Oh, well, David, that's your, whatever my favorite sin is. Gossip for somebody and lust for somebody else and internet pornography for somebody else. It's, it's probably, it's, it, that probably refers to whoever, whatever my favorite sin is. Well, that's certainly possible, but I think contextually it is more likely that it's referring to the one sin that easily wraps itself around all of us as Christians, and that is the sin of a lack of faith. And you know, I don't struggle with some sins, but walking by sight and not by faith is a constant struggle. I bet it is for most of you, too. And what we are supposed to be doing, you see, is living the Christian life by faith. The Scripture says, the just shall live by faith. The author of Hebrews quotes that previously in chapter 10. The just shall live by faith. And now we have a chapter 11, all the witnesses of faith. And now we come to chapter 12, laying aside that sin that so easily entangles us. The author throughout Hebrews talks about disobedience to God, lack of faith, unfaith. He uses the Old Testament Exodus generation and their unfaith as an example to us of what not to do. So I think there contextually he's talking about faith. We need to be young men and women of faith. Live by faith. Walk by faith. Now be careful. Faith is not a blind man in a dark room looking for a black cat that isn't there. That's what a lot of people think faith is. Oh, you Christians, you talk about faith all the time. And, and you all talk about faith. And, you know, and then those of us that are atheists over here, you know, we don't have any faith. I'm reading now Bill Dembski's latest book. Bill Dembski is a leading... Uh, uh, mover in the intelligent design movement. He's written several books. He's a professor at Southwestern Seminary. In fact, I'm his dean. He has about 485 degrees. He's the smartest man I've ever known. Uh, he has a degree in mathematics. And I don't know what else. I can't even talk to him. He's so far above me. But nevertheless, I'm reading, I, read, I was reading half of it on the plane flying over here yesterday, and Dembski talks about how people that are atheists have just as much faith as people that are Christians. Their system of atheism requires faith it's the same kind of thing. And furthermore, Christians who have faith have evidence for that faith. We have good grounds for our faith. The evidence for the resurrection, for example, is clear. So we are to run this race with endurance, laying aside that sin of unbelief. Listen, if you ever want to be successful in the Christian life, mark it down in your little black book. You're going to have to be a man or a woman of faith. And so now we see we are to run, laying aside the weights and sins. We see we are to run, being aware of the cloud of witnesses who've gone before us. Those two things precede the main verb, the main point of the passage. Do you see that? Now look at what comes in the remainder of verse 1. Let us run with endurance the race set before us. The author actually takes that phrase, with endurance, and puts it in front of the clause. Literally, it reads like this. With endurance, let us run the race. The focus, the emphasis, the impact is on endurance. Let us run with endurance. Now, let me just ask you, are you enduring today? Are you enduring in that mathematics class? Are you suffering through your English class? Are you enduring in your Bible class? Now, those are specific examples that are indigenous to you as a student right now being in college. But the question is, you see, are you enduring? How easy do you give up on things? What does it take to cause you to quit? What will it take for you to quit. Mr. Grandfather Clock was standing in the stately mansion and he got to thinking to himself. And he said, you know, I've been standing here a long time. I, I wonder how many ticks I tick here every day and every month and every year. And he began to calculate and he began to think, well, let's see, I tick two ticks a second. That's a 120 ticks a minute, that's 7,200 ticks an hour, that's 172,800 ticks a day, that's 5,184,000 ticks a month, that's 62,208,000 ticks a year. Oh, I'm just all ticked out, I can't keep ticking on. And so the men in the little white suits came and they took the grandfather clock to the clock psychiatrist. And the clock psychiatrist said, well, Mr. Grandfather Clock, what seems to be your problem? 
And the grandfather clock said, Doc, I, I'm all ticked out. I can't keep ticking. I, I tick two ticks a second, 120 ticks a minute, 7,200 ticks an hour, 172,800 ticks a day, 52 million ticks a year. I just can't keep going, Doc. I'm all ticked out. And the wise clock psychiatrist said, well, uh, Mr. Grandfather Clock, let me ask you a question. How many ticks do you tick a second? And the grandfather clock thought, and he said, well, let me see. Tick, tock, tick, tock. Well, I guess I tick two ticks a second. And the wise clock psychiatrist said, well, Mr. Grandfather Clock, let me ask you. How many ticks do you tick when you tick? And the grandfather clock thought, and he said, well, let me see. Tick, tock, tick, tock. Well, I guess I just tick one tick every time I tick. And the clock psychiatrist said, Mr. Grandfather Clock, let me tell you what I want you to do. Go back and stand in the hallway of that state Lee mansion where you have been standing for many years. And I want you to stand there and I want you to just keep on ticking away, tick tock, just one tick at a time. And you know what? Last time I heard about Mr. Grandfather Clock, he's been now for a long time in the hallway of that mansion, ticking away, tick tock talk just one tick at a time. The way you live the Christian life, the way you run the Christian's marathon is one step at a time. The famous proverb says the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. And you just live for Jesus every day. And after you live for him today, you live for him tomorrow. And then you live for him the next day. And you don't worry about 10 days or two weeks or three months or a year down the road. You just live for Jesus now. With endurance, you run the race that is set before you. And then notice the third circumstance that goes along with this in verse 2. We are, remember now, we are to run seeing we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. We are to run number two, laying aside weights and sins that easily besets us. Here comes number three in verse two. Do you see it? It's the third part of the simple. Look at it. Here it comes. Fixing our eyes. Look at there. The author of Hebrews was from Georgia. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. And so now there is a third way that we go about running the Christian's marathon. And that is our focus must be on Jesus. Just can't take your eyes off of Jesus. Fixing your eyes on Jesus. Listen, if you look at others, you'll be discouraged. If you look at yourself, if you're one of those people and your life is all mirrors and no windows, then you're going to be a pretty depressed person. But if you will keep your gaze fixed on Jesus, if he will attract your attention, the word that is used there in the Greek New Testament is a word that describes a lover looking at his loved one. I saw her in the ocean, the water up to her waist at Panama City Beach in about 1976. And uh, I thought she was the prettiest thing I had seen. I was there. I was already in college myself. It was my first year, completed my first year. I was about to start my second year in college. And I had moved back to Georgia for the summer to be an interim pastor of a little country church there outside of Rome. And we had a small group of teenagers, and we uh, took them on a mission trip. And there were with a much larger, two or three larger churches. And there was a young girl there who also had just graduated from high school. She was a year younger than me. and She was about to start college, and her name was Sherry. And I saw her out there in the ocean, standing out there. And I couldn't take my eyes off of her. And I was standing there, David, with Todd Zyga in the ocean. I was standing there in the ocean. And I said, I'm going to go over and talk to that girl. And Todd said, well, you might want to be sure you wipe all the seaweed off your face before you do because you look pretty gross right now. And so I couldn't take my eyes off. went over there and started talking to her. One thing led to another thing. Well, we've been married now for over 31 years. And I couldn't take my eyes off of her. She, I just couldn't quit looking at her. I mean, she just, she caught my attention. She held my attention. She kept my attention. My gaze, my focus was on that girl. Spiritually, where's your focus today? Is your focus spiritually on somebody else? Is it on yourself? Or is it on Jesus? Now listen to me. 
The time will come when if you run this Christian life, you live the Christian life running this race, and you don't keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, I can promise you Rocky Road is coming ahead. You'll have problems. You'll have difficulties. You're going to have some problems and difficulties anyway. All of us do. There'll be times you trip up. There'll be times you fall and skin your knees. There'll be times someone will come around a corner and they'll push you. And you'll be treated unjustly. What are you going to do? You're going to say, well, I'm not going to keep running. People don't treat me right. No. What you're going to do, what you should do, the author says, is you want to keep your eyes focused and fixed on Jesus. That's the way to make it through college. That's the way to make it through any educational institution. That's the way to make it through a marriage. That's the way to make it through a family. That's the way to make it through a career. That's the way to make it through a ministry. And that's the only way to make it through a life. Keeping your eyes focused, fixed on Jesus. And why him? What's so special about him anyway? Well, look what the author says. Who, well, first of all, he is the author and the perfecter of faith. He was there at the starting line when you started running the moment you were saved. And he'll be there at the finish line welcoming you home when you complete your race. And he's also there every step of the way in between. Remember, he told us that in Matthew 28, didn't he? Didn't he say, I am with you always? And so he will always be with us. He's at the beginning. He's at the end. He is the author, the initiator of faith. He is the perfecter, the one who brings you to completion. He will do that for you, but you need to cooperate with him and serve and love him all of your life. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. Now, why Jesus? Look at what he did. Who? See, that relative pronoun modifies Jesus. What's so special? About Jesus, the author is about to tell you, who for the joy set before him, here comes the word, endured the cross. You see, Jesus looked down the corridors of time, as it were, and saw all of those who would become his followers, all who would be redeemed by his blood shed on the cross. And as a result of that, that was his joy. You are his joy. You are Jesus' joy today. He suffered for you He did so because he saw down the road what would accrue in the kingdom of God and your salvation and your place in heaven. And so for the joy set before him, he endured. You better always keep your eyes on that which is truly real and that which is truly permanent and that which is truly spiritual and never become distracted by all of the things of this world that can keep you from living for Christ. And so, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, he despised the shame of the cross, and then what did he do? After he died, he rose again, and 40 days later, what happened? He ascended to heaven and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And the author in Greek puts the main verb at the very end, and it literally reads like this, that who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and at the right hand of the throne of God, perfect tense verb in Greek, he He has for all time finally and fully sat down as God's king and he reigns in your life forever and ever and ever. You need to know that to endure the troubles you're going to have in your life. Now you haven't lived long enough yet to have too many. Some of you have, but most of you haven't. But as time goes by, you'll have those troubles along the way. I promise you that. And so what does the writer say? Let us with endurance run the race set before us, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus. In 1983 in Australia, it was time for the world's longest race. It is called the Ultra Marathon. It is a race from Sydney to Melbourne, a distance, are you ready, of 652 miles. It is the longest sporting event anywhere. On this date, 1983, about 150 of the world's finest, 
long distance runners had come to participate in the ultra marathon, 652 miles. Now, folks, I, I, I'm assuming you understand that you don't run 652 miles in a day or two. That you're talking about, you know, five, six, seven days to do that. It is a grueling race. And so here was everybody. And out of the crowd came a man, 61 years of age, by the name of Cliff Young, wearing overalls, wearing boots and galoshes over his boots. He walked up to the registration table and requested a number to run in the race. The people at the table thought that this is crazy. You're kidding. You don't, you're not. This is a joke. But he made it clear it was no joke. He was a sheep farmer and a sheep herder and potato farmer there in Australia. He owned a farm of 2,000 acres with a couple of thousand head of sheep. And he came to run in the ultra marathon. He got a number. They pinned it on him. Overalls now. Only two teeth in his head. Wearing boots. Are you with me? Boots. Not Nikes. Okay. Boots and galoshes over his boots. He walks to the starting line. The other runners are looking at him incredulously. They can't. This is unbelievable. Who is this nut? The people in the crowd see him as he walks. He's wearing overalls. He's 61. They can't believe it. The gun goes off, and as the other runners begin the race, professional runners in the way that they begin, they immediately surged out ahead of Cliff Young, but to everybody's amazement, instead of running in the normal way that people run, Cliff Young ran with an odd, peculiar kind of shuffle. And he began to run back and forth, back, began to run on the racetrack. The others kind of left him in the dust, and he's shuffling along. People began to laugh. The news people there watching on camera, people all over Australia are watching. People are laughing. Somebody calls out, get that old fool off the track. Five days, nine hours, and 15 minutes later, across the last hill and down the last straightaway came Cliff Young. Shuffling along. And he crossed the finish line and won the ultra marathon. And he didn't win by a minute or by five minutes. He set a new world record beating the old world record by nine hours. The media went nuts. They couldn't believe it. What in the world is going on? They mobbed him when he crossed the line. They were ripping his knapsack off of his back. What kind of, what kind of food did he eat? He must have some kind of super duper food. That he, and they discovered that he lived on pumpkin seeds and water. They were tearing his shoes from his feet, his galoshes and his boots. He must have some kind of special running shoes. It wasn't that. And then the secret was discovered. When you run the ultra marathon, you run 18 hours straight. And then you stop and sleep for six hours. And then you get up and run 18 more. Then you stop and you sleep. But nobody told Cliff Young that. And he didn't know that's what you do. And Cliff Young shuffled his way to victory in the ultra marathon. Breaking the world record in 1983 by nine hours. Because he ran five days and nine hours and 15 minutes without ever stopping to sleep. The race is not always to the swift or the strong 
or those whose names are in lights. The race, biblically, is to those who are faithful and to those who sell out to Jesus and who run with endurance the race and who choose not to sleep spiritually, but who endure to the end. Let us, with endurance, run the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. May God make it so. Father in heaven, I pray that the men and women in this room right now who are students at this institution and faculty and staff here and other guests who are here, Lord, that each one of us would pay the price to endure on the racetrack of the Christian's marathon and that we would run and remain faithful and endure no matter what and thus one day here those words that we long to hear when we get to heaven from Jesus himself when he says, well done, good and faithful servant. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.